good evening to our New Beginning family, and good evening to those who are joining us online. We thank you so much for joining us on this day. We thank and praise God for giving us another opportunity just to uh, be here on today. We thank God for bringing us all the way from Mississippi and Tennessee and bringing us back to Houston, Texas. Our scripture for tonight will come from Psalm 136. And I'm going to need your help, Psalm 136. I am going to read the first part of the verse, and I'm going to ask you to read the second part, for his mercy endures forever. For his mercy endures forever. That's what you're going to say. For his mercy endures forever. So that's Psalm 136. The first verse begins like this. All give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. All give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. All give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. Now let's read verse number 26 all together. Let's go. All give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. And our song tonight is God is a good God. He's a great God. He can do anything but fail. He's moved so many mountains out of my way. God is a good God. So help me sing that God is a good God. Father God, 
God, we thank you now. We honor you, Father, for you are the good God. God, you are the great God. God, you can do anything but fail. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for just being God all by yourself. Lord, we thank you now. We bless your holy name. We ask you to bless us, Father God, as we listen to your word, we observe your word, as we dive into your word. We ask you that your word will become real to us tonight, that everybody who hears your word will respond favorably to your word. Bless us tonight, Father God. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for messing up. Forgive us for falling short. We ask you to bless us, Father God, that we will hear from you in a mighty way. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. He has moved so many mountains. God is. He's a wonderful God. Amen. Praise the Lord. The God we serve is such an awesome and amazing and wonderful God. And we've come to here tonight to bless his name, to hear from him, to watch what he has to say. We are on page 26 of our Experiencing God book. Page 26, we endeavor to do pages 26, 27, and 28. We'll finish out unit number one. Page 26, 27, and 28. I need some readers, some readers. Uh, Sister so Daisy, will you take uh, the first portion of the paragraph? Well, just take the whole paragraph, if you would. Go all the way from the bottom of page 26, beginning where it says, God reveals what he's about to do. Bottom of page 26, and stop at the top of page number 27. Sister Davis, Davis, would you take uh, what can one ordinary man do? Starting with a wonderful scripture. And uh, there's a book on my desk. If you can you go get that book off the desk for her, please. Uh, and there's a book on the desk. You're gonna be on page 27. Brother Miles, will you start with on page 27 with the white moody? The white L moody in red, the white L moody, and go to the bottom of that page where we stop. And I want you to stop right before the number two. Sister Bonnie, would you go start with number two and take that entire paragraph? Then I will finish it off with God's standards are different from ours. Amen? Everybody good? Everybody good? We'll be looking at several scriptures on tonight, several different scriptures, and we're going to talk about how God reveals himself to us uh, before he uh, asks us to do anything, he reveals to us what he's about to do. Amen? He reveals on page 26, page 27 and 28. Uh, page 26, Brother Sister Davis. Page 27, Sister Davis. Davis is going to read from what can God, what can one ordinary man do? down to where it says her life, his, his or her life. Brother Miles is going to read the white Newey all the way down where number two is, and then Sister Bernie will take number two all the way to the top of the page 28. And I'll close it out for tonight. Yes? Yes. Amen, amen. God is in the blessing business. He's revealing himself unto us. So Sister Davis is going to take that paragraph. Okay. And it reads, God reveals what he is about to do. That revelation becomes an invitation to join him. Number four, God talked to Moses about his will. God wanted Moses to go to Egypt and be his instrument to deliver the Israelites from their bondage. God revealed to Moses his holiness, his mercy, his power, his name, and his purpose to keep his promise to, to keep his promise to Abraham and to give Israel the promised land. Number five, Moses offered many subject objections. He questioned whether God 
could do such a great work through someone like him. See Exodus 3 and 11. Whether the Israelites would believe God had appeared to him. See Exodus 4 and 1. And whether he was capable of speaking eloquently enough to accomplish the task. Exodus 4 and 10. In each case, Moses was doubting God more than himself. Moses faced a crisis of belief. And that is, is God really able to do what he says? Number five, Moses' faith is described in Hebrews, however, as a model of self-sacrifice and trust in Almighty God. Once God let Moses know what he was about to do, that revelation became Moses' invitation to join him. Number six, Moses made the necessary adjustments to orient his life to God. Moses had to come to the place where he believed God could do everything he said he would do. Then he had to leave his job and in-laws and move to Egypt. After making these adjustments, he was in a position to obey God. That did not mean he was going to do something all by himself for God. It meant he was going to be where God was, working so God would do what he had purposed to do in the first place. Moses was a servant who was moldable, and he remained in God's, at God's disposal to be used as God chose. God accomplished his purposes through him. When God does a God-sized work through your life, you will be humbled before him. Number seven, Moses must have felt unworthy to be used in such a significant way. Moses obeyed and did everything God told him. Then God accomplished through Moses all he had intended. Every step of obedience brought Moses and Israel to a greater knowledge of God. And that's Exodus 6, 1 through 8. Thank you. So when we're looking at the fact that God dealt with Moses in such a way that he gave him a revelation. The author talks about the fact that God shows man, woman, boy, girl, God shows us what he's about to do before he does it. Are there any objections to that tonight? Does God always show us what he's about to do before he does it? So there are some objections to that tonight. Yes? We can't see it now. Sometimes mm -hmm. So the author says God reveals what he is about to do. That revelation becomes an invitation. So what he's saying is God met Moses at this burning bush that never was consumed. And as he met him at this burning bush that was never consumed, he gave him an invitation to come join him where he's at work. So God is inviting all of us, even today, to come and join him where he's already at work. Do you, do you agree that God is at work around us doing some things? Amen. He's doing some things around yeah. us, and, and sometimes we don't understand what he's doing. That's right. Sometimes we realize that we are not worthy of what he's doing. And have you ever felt like you're called to do something, or God is unctioning you to do something, and you're not equipped to get it done? What was Moses' problem? What were some of the things, some of the excuses Moses came up with? He couldn't speak. He couldn't speak. He couldn't speak. He, he stuttered real, really badly. What else did he say? He thought he was unworthy, right? God, why, why me, Lord? Have you ever had a why me, Lord moments? Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a moment, God, I know you're not calling me to do this. Yeah. I know this, ain't, this is not God. I know that's not you calling me to do this. You need to call Joe Blow across the street, but not me, right? Mm -hmm. So God talked to Moses about God's will. Amen. God is trying to get all of us to get to the point where we understand God's will. God is trying to show us his will. The author talks about earlier that as he shows us his will, what he's really doing is preparing us to do greater things. 
And when you feel uncomfortable about it, then guess what? You are feeling unworthy. You are feeling like you ought to call on somebody else. God revealed to Moses his holiness. What is holiness? How he's separated. He's set aside. He is sinless. God is without sin. He is holy. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah says, After King Uzziah died, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw God like never before. I saw God high and lifted up. I saw God's train fill the temple. His glory fill the temple. So what he was saying is that I saw God like never before. His train filled the temple. His holiness was present. His glory was present. God is trying to show us his holiness. Amen. And in the midst, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah says that when I saw God and I looked at myself and I compared myself to the almighty God, I realized that self was messed up. It reminds us to always compare ourselves to Jesus, compare ourselves to God. Because Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah goes on to say, after I saw God like I've never seen him before, then I not only saw myself, I saw the rest of my buddies. And I realized that they are messed up, I messed up, we all need God because God is holy and we are not holy. Yes. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you've been with Christ. God is the, is the ultimate holiness. His holiness is a holiness that you can't get beyond. Some people get so holy you can't even have a conversation with them. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, yeah what you been up to? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. The Lord is walking with me and oh, I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. I just ask you what you been doing. We ought to get to a point in our lives where we can be holy without demonstrating holiness in our speech. Holiness means that we are set aside. We are different. We are of God. But we still got to live in this world. We have to go to business meetings and talk business. We have to go to, to meetings with, with teammates and talk team business. And we still ought to demonstrate holiness in our lifestyle. The God we serve is holy. The second thing he says is God wants to demonstrate to us as he revealed to Moses his mercy. When you deserve to die, God gave you mercy. And everybody in this room deserved to die. Everybody in this room needed mercy. Everybody in this room needs mercy. Everybody in this room on tomorrow will need mercy. Mercy will suit the case. Mercy is when you deserve something bad and don't get it. Some of us know what mercy is based on our family structure. Some children don't know what mercy is. Mercy is when they say to you, all right, I know you did wrong, but I'm going to let you go. And they let us go for a long time, long time, long time. Then they're going to get you for old and for new. It's because we need to understand that mercy will suit the case. And mercy, God gives us mercy when we don't deserve it. What's the difference between mercy and grace? God is a merciful God. God is a gracious God. There's a difference in God giving us his amazing grace and God giving us mercy. Is there a difference? Or can we use those words interchangeably? Have you ever thought about the difference between grace and mercy? We talk about it all the time that, that God has given us grace and God has given us mercy. If they were the same, should we have to say them both? They're not the same. 
Oh, they're not the same. Come on, educate me tonight then. Tell me about it. When he's giving us grace, he's blessing us in spite of us. But when he's giving us mercy, he's not punishing us as much as we need to be. Mm -hmm. So when he gives us grace, let me make sure I interpret this properly. Uh, when he gives us grace, he does what now? He's blessing us even he's, if we don't deserve it. He's, he's blessing us when we don't deserve it. How many of you in the room deserve anything you have? How many of you in this room deserve to wake up this morning? How many of you deserve to have the peace of mind you have? How many of you deserve to be with the associates you with? One woman said it like this. She says, uh, if I could just find me a piece of man, I'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> just a piece, just a piece. But we don't even deserve our state of mind. We don't even deserve the food we eat. So God gives us what we don't deserve. That's grace. Now, how did you define mercy? In mercy, he doesn't punish us the way we deserve. He doesn't punish us the way we deserve. How many of y'all deserve to be living today? How many of you should have lost your life in the last thing you did? Or previous things? But God has given us mercy. God is trying to show us, as he has shown Moses, that he is a merciful God. The next thing he's trying to show us is his power. When Moses went to Egypt, he went to Egypt, he couldn't speak, God gave him his brother, and then he got to Egypt, Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go, and when Pharaoh would not let the people go, guess what happened? God had to show his power. Ten different miracles took place, and they took place because of who God is. But somebody tell me what those 10 miracles where you give them in any order. Don't give them the easy ones right off the bat. What's, the, what's one of them? Huh? Flies. Flies! No. Now, flies everywhere. Flies in the cooking pot. You know, flies in the restaurant. Flies in the bed. Flies. I mean flies in the folk ears. Flies. They go to sleep and they wake up. Flies in their eyes. Flies. Everywhere they look, they will flies. What's the number? Water turned to blood. They didn't even have bottled water. And then the places that, and we are modernizing this, the places that, that, that sanitized the water and made it drinkable, potable water, that had blood in it. The water flat turned to blood. Didn't turn to wine, but it turned to blood. What's another one? Who can me count? That's two. Firstborn dies. First, but that's the ultimate one. The firstborn of the Egyptians firstborn. passed away. Firstborn male. Firstborn child, or the firstborn male child of the Egyptians died. Why then the firstborn of the Israelites died? First of all, God showed his power. God is able to, to skip, have the death angel skip over people. But how did they do it? How did he do it? Yes, ma'am. Put the blood on the post of the door. So they killed the lamb, put blood over the doorpost. And the death angel passed over. Wherever there was blood, the death angel passed over. Isn't that something? God showing his power. What's another one? Livestock diseased. The diseased livestock. That sounds kind of bookish. <laughs> Y'all know what bookish mean? <laughs> sounds bookish. So, how, how do, does she talk like that all the time? <laughs> no, that's bookish. So livestock became diseased. The livestock became diseased. Anybody else? The, the, the livestock. Why was it important for the livestock to have no diseases? Why was that important? That's food. Because this is what the people used to eat, right? This is this provided food. What's another uh, miracle that God did to, in order for Pharaoh to let the people go? The boils. The boils. What, is, what are boils? It's like sores. Sores. Where did the sores appear? The person or the animal or everybody. 
on people's skin, on animals. I mean, boys, just sit up. All of a sudden, you walk in and they just pop it, they jump on you like an armed man. Balls, balls, balls. What else? What was the other? How is God showing his power? What's another miracle? Locusts. Locusts. Locusts are all over the place. Boy, there's some members of the New Beginning Church. They couldn't take the flies. They couldn't take the locusts. <laughs> they, they, they certainly couldn't take the critters. So you got locusts. What's another miracle? There was frogs everywhere. Frogs, I mean jumping frogs, moving frogs. Frogs everywhere. Sister Virginia Brown said there was darkness. There was one, is that one of them? Let's see if Sister Virginia Brown right. There was darkness, darkness. It became midnight at midday. All day long it was darkness. There was darkness. There was darkness. How many do we have so far? Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Rain ice. Rain ice. What is rain ice called? Hell. Hell. How you spell it? H-E-L-L? H-I-L. H-A-I-L. H-A-I-L. Hell. Ice water falling. I mean ice water falling. Now in Houston, we have ice falling in the middle of something. God is showing us his power. God is able to have hell falling on the north side and sun shining across the street. God demonstrates his power. What's another miracle that God does? Or God did? How many is that? That's ten. That's ten. So we got the dying babies, the first male born, of the Egyptian, we have hail falling, we have flies, we have frogs. What's another one? Lice. Lice? I thought you said that was another We just said that one, didn't we? Lice, lice, we didn't say lice. There's lice, there's lice. Makes you itch right now. I mean, lice. Ooh, good God of life. There's darkness, that's six. There are balls, seven. Locust. There are locusts, eight. Livestock. Livestock dying. Water to blood. And the water turned to blood. Yes. God is trying to show us today his power. How's he showing us his power in today's land? There are tornadoes everywhere. Here in Texas, we saw today water sprouts. What's a water sprout? Water sprout, spout. What's a water spout? It's a tornado over the water where the, the tornado drops down from the skies and stirs up the water, and it's just as dangerous, dangerous if you're out there on the water. It's a tornado on the water. So God is showing his power. He's demonstrating to us that he's God, regardless of who's the president, he's God. Regardless who's the governor, whether he's walking or rolling, regardless of who's the governor, he's God. God is demonstrating to us in the 21st century that he's God. It's amazing to me when I went to uh, Silver City, Mississippi, to de de deliver care packages that you had given. Uh, it's amazing how this whole community was torn up. Flat people lost their lives. A beam came out, was thrown out of a a, um, a a mobile home. A long beam, metal beam that covers from one one end of the mobile home to the other, was thrown out across two streets and went into a house and killed them. Beam from his neighbor's mobile home went all the way across two, two streets and went into a house. And that man just happened to be sitting there. Isn't that amazing? When they had the, her, the, the tornado in Inverness, Mississippi, I think it was 1972, you can go through there and see where a plastic straw 
had been driven into a wood tree. And the straw was still steady. God shows his power. Now, I don't know the physics behind it. I don't know how God did it. But he demonstrates his power to all mankind. Took a plastic straw, drove it into a tree, and when the wind had stopped, that plastic straw looked like it had no damage, but it was driven into a wooden tree. It's the power of God. Physics says that straw should have bursted, that straw should have torn, that straw should have not been able to go through that tree. But God is able to show his power like no one else can. So he goes on to say, God wants to demonstrate his name to us. His name. There is no name like the name of God. There is no name that you can call on like the name of God. I'm calling on your name, God. That's why in the Old Testament, when they pray, they, they talk to God and say, God, I'm calling on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's right. In other words, don't get it mixed up. I'm calling on the God of the Bible. Right. I'm calling on his name. Because there are many small G gods. Some gods are Lexus. Some gods are Ford. Some gods are G. MC. I ain't talking about those gods. I'm talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm calling on the God that has made himself known by way of the Bible. I'm calling on the God of the Bible. Amen. The pastor in Belize, when he talks to, to because there was witchcraft all around, and I asked the question, does this particular lady honor God? He said, yes, she honors a God, but not the God of the Bible. You want to make sure you call on the God of the Bible. Amen. Jehovah God, Yahweh God, the God of the Bible, the God that made heaven and earth, the God of the Bible. The final thing he says is that, that God wanted to reveal himself through his purpose. God wants us to know his purpose. God wants us to know that he has a purpose. His purpose is being revealed to Moses, and his purpose ought to be revealed to us. Amen. And if it's not, say, God, reveal to me your purpose. How I many of you know you're on planet Earth for a purpose? Yes. And you're here for God's purpose. You're here for, for God to use you. And we're going to get to that when we talk about the ordinary person. You are here for God's purpose. To keep his promise to Abraham. There he is. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is the God we call it on. Amen. And to give Israel the promised land. We call it on that God. The God that promised to give Israel this promised land. Moses offered many objections. Moses was, was a guy that could find some excuses if he had to look on a rock. How many excuses you have? Raise your hand if one of your excuses have been, I'm not a night person. Okay, let me see if I can get somebody here. I'm not a morning person. Uh-oh, got one. Raise both of your hands if you know you're not a morning person. Hand, feet, arm, body, neck. You know, I'm not a morning person. Raise your hand if, if, if you are introvert and you use that for an excuse. I don't like people. I don't like speaking before people. I don't like participating before people. If you are a person who, who, who is an extrovert and you use that for an excuse. I like moving and shaking. If you ask me to sit down and do a little job like that, I can't do it. I like moving and shaking. Sister Davis, sometimes if she sit too long, guess what? She got to get up and walk around. Why, Brother Ma? I don't know. She got to have some moving and shaking. <laughs> if she ain't moving and shaking, she's uncomfortable. 
Yes. Yes, she's not moving in shape. I mean, if something's not going on, if it's not the... She's bored to death. You have children not running all over the place and they're not making noise, she's out of her league. How many people have used the excuses that God made me this way and God understands? When we were preparing to go on our domestic mission trip, we went over to Bethel's family and uh, he pulled out this box, the Bethel's, Bethel's heavenly hand, they give away food, right? So he was donating food for our mission trip and, and those food items were snacks. And he comes out with this big old giant box of Oreo cookies. Chocolate Oreo cookies. I was like, man, you know that, man. I mean, a huge box of Oreo cookies. I had to hide them because we didn't want the children to get sick off this huge box of Oreo cookies. So guess what Pastor James Lee says? He says, God understands Oreo cookies because he made them. <laughs> so what was he saying, Mike? What was he saying, Mike? He said that the, 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 the purchasing that's the, that's of the, the Oreo cookies is justified because the Lord made the Oreo cookies. Oh, so you got to say that again. Yeah. So he says God understands Oreo cookies because God made Oreo cookies. So what was he saying, Mike? He was saying that by him purchasing and donating the Oreo cookies, it's justified because... The Lord made Oreos right. He made the ingredients. He made the person that invented the Oreos. So obviously God knows what's in the Oreos. He knows that the Oreos is going to the people to nourish them. Uh-huh. So in other words, it's all right for me to eat all those Oreo cookies. Basically. I think that's an excuse. So he gave us all these Oreo cookies. I would have had a bunch of sick children and adults on the bus going down the road if I had given out those Oreo cookies. But that's how we do things, right? We get to a point in our lives where we want what we want, when we want it, the way we want it, and we want God to let us have it the way we want it. Yes? Moses offered all of these objections. He talks about not being capable of speaking eloquently. Now, God, you're sending me before the president of Egypt. And as I go before the president of Egypt, the pharaoh of Egypt, God, you know I can't speak eloquently. And the president, the pharaoh of Egypt, is one, he's going to want somebody who has eloquent speech. Another one of his excuses. Moses was not just doubting himself. He was doubting his God. Let me tell you, God can do some things with us that we can't do with us. So whenever you get to a point where you think you're not worthy, whenever you get to a point where you think that you should be doubting what God can do through you, you're not just doubting yourself, you're doubting your God. Yes, comments, questions. You're doubting your God. If you're, you're doubting what you are doing, you are doubting your God of what you cannot do. So Moses faced a crisis of belief. God really is able to do what God said. The question is, is God able to do what God said? The problem is some of us get ahead of God and God had made any promises. God had told us to go. But we get ahead of God and when we get out there, then we say, Lord, now you know. I did this because I thought you were calling me to do it. The other thing about a crisis of belief, many times God tells us to do things that we think is going to be smooth sailing. And when you get out there and it gets hard, you say, Lord, you didn't tell me to do this. Yes, he told you to do it. But because in every life we have a crisis of belief, in every life we run into stuff that we don't want to deal with even though God sent us. It's called a model of self-sacrifice. We got to sacrifice ourselves for God. Why should we sacrifice ourselves for God? Because God sacrificed 
the ultimate one for us. His name is Jesus. We must remain moldable. We must remain in the hands of God. We must stay with God. Remember the cup I brought forth? I said to you that the cup maker, the potter, took some clay and made the cup, painted the cup purple. You must stay in the hands of God because when you're in his hands, you're in some safe hands. You must be moldable in God's hands. You have to be moldable in God's hands. Because when you are moldable in the hands of God, God can use you. You must maintain and remain in God's hands so he can use you. God is at work. God is doing a God-sized work. And he's doing it through you as you remain humble. God is doing it through you. But you got to remain humble. The bottom of the page, page 26 says, Moses obeyed and did everything God told him. Then God accomplished through Moses all God intended to accomplish. Amen. When you remain in the hands of God, when you obey God, God can accomplish, accomplish through you everything that God has in store for you. But you gotta remain in God's hands. You gotta remain humble. You gotta remain moldable. Every step of obedience brought Moses and Israel to a greater knowledge of God. When you look at the Bible, the Bible says, Psalms 103, I think, Psalm 103, it says like this, it says, God showed his ways to Moses showed his mighty acts to the children of Israel. Everybody got to get to know God's ways. And as you're in the hands of God, and as God uses you, he makes sure that you have a greater knowledge of God. How do you want to know God in a greater way? Even when it doesn't make sense, God show me you. That was a song back home, the Pearl Gospel Singles. The Reed brothers was in the Pearl, Pearl Gospel Singles. And they used to come to our church. Their daddy was our pastor. They used to come to the church and they used to sing this song, I want to be more like Jesus in every way. And even as a little boy, I knew something was wrong with that song. Because they said, I want to be more like Jesus in every way. I want to be more like Jesus every day. I want to walk like him. I want to talk like him. I want to live like him. And then when they said, I want to die like him, I said, something wrong. I said, something wrong. Let's stop singing this song. I can live based on how he affords me to live like him, but I don't want to die like him. Because he died the ultimate death for all mankind. But as a little boy, I used to sit in the choir and look at them sing that song in the quartet, and I was like, something wrong with this song here? I can afford to live like him, but I can't afford to die like him. Something wrong with this song. What can one ordinary person do? Who's reading? Sister Davis Davis. What can one ordinary person do? The microphone. A wonderful scripture that was helped me at this point. Elijah was a human being as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced fruit. Uh, Elijah was an ordinary person just like us who prayed, and God responded powerfully. When God healed the crippled beggar through Peter, Peter and John were called before the Sanhedrin, uh, the highest Jewish court in the land, to give an account of their actions. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter boldly spoke to the religious leaders. 
Notice the leader's response. When they say, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, that were, they were astonished. They took note that these men had been with Jesus, Acts 4, 13 in NIV. The people were generally see in the scripture were, were ordinary. Their relationships with God and the activity of God made them ordinary. Do you notice this statement? The leaders recognized Peter and John had been with Jesus. Everyone who takes the time to enter an intimate relationship with God can see him do ordinary things through his or her life. Extraordinary yeah. things. God is willing to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. Isn't that something? You think you are ordinary, and you are. But God will do extraordinary things to ordinary people if you just stay in the hands of God. Amen. I mean, extraordinary stuff. I mean, stuff you can't even pray over. Stuff you can't even beg God for. God is able to do extraordinary stuff through ordinary people. How many ordinary people we got today? Everybody want to be ordinary, right? But every now and then, we want God to do some extraordinary stuff to us. Yes? Use me, God, to do some extraordinary stuff. Brother back home was at a swimming pool, and a little boy had, had disappeared underwater. And he, he saw him underwater. By that time, the mother saw this little boy underwater. He was lifeless. Brother jumped into the pool, brought him out the pool, began to do chest compressions and stomach compressions, and the boy lifeless body began to regain color. He began to cough, cry, and breathe again. They awarded him a medal for doing something extraordinary. Let me tell you, God is willing to do things spiritually extraordinary in you if you yield yourself to the Lord. It's amazing. It's amazing what God can do with you and through you. God can use you. Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, I saw the Lord high lifted up. His train filled the temple. His glory filled the room. Smoke filled the room. And it, it, I saw his train fill every crevice. His glory. He says the door post shook extraordinarily. If God can use and an inanimate object and move a lifeless doorpost through his glory, how much more can he use you? Who has life, who has breath, who has muscles. If God can make the doorpost move, if God can reseat the doorpost, how much more can God use you? You remember the children of Israel marching around the walls of Jericho? Theologians believe that the walls didn't just fall down. Theologians say the walls receded into the ground because they were obedient to God and God wanted to demonstrate his power that his people were walking with him. The, the next, next uh, thing he talks about is that Elijah was an ordinary man. And because he was an ordinary man, God used him because he was in God's will. He used an ordinary man to do extraordinary things. Elijah prayed to God, asked God to not let it rain. And he was bold enough to go tell King Ahab, it ain't gonna rain until I say so. Yes, he says to Ahab, the, the crops, the stock, livestock, everything going to suffer until I say so. That sounds arrogant, doesn't it? But he had connection with God. He was bold enough. He trusted God enough. He knew he was in the hands of God enough for him to declare, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. He prayed. 
dry hill back to rain, but the rain has to be We prayed again. We told Ahab it's going to rain now. Prayed again, and rain fell. He honored God. He stayed with the Lord. The next analogy he gives about the crippled man, Peter and John, and they they were they were up against the Sanhedrin council, the highest court in the land of Israel. Religious folk. Peter boldly spoke to the religious leaders. Notice that the leaders responded this way. We see that these men are unschooled. Meaning they are uneducated. Meaning that they don't know the Bible. They don't know the law. They have not been to seminary. They are unschooled, ordinary folk. And even though they are unschooled, we have evidence that they've been with Jesus. Wow. Can people look at you and say that you've been with Jesus? Can people look at you and come to the conclusion through your actions and come to the conclusion you've been with Jesus? Or can people look at you and say you ordinary yesterday and you ordinary today? You're just an ordinary person. They don't mean anything. God is not willing to use them. They're just ordinary people. And since they're ordinary people, God's not going to use them. They're just ordinary people. But let me tell you, when you stay in the hands of God, God is able to bless you and use you because he can take ordinary people and do extraordinary things. When you have an intimate relationship with God, you can see him do extraordinary things in your life, his life and her life. God is willing to do extraordinary stuff in your life. You got to stay with God. Dwight Moody. Who's reading Dwight Moody? Dwight Moody. Dwight L. Moody was a poorly educated, unordained shoe salesman who felt God's call to preach the gospel. Early one morning, he and some friends gathered for prayer confession, and consecration. They heard Henry Varley say, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. Moody was deeply moved by those words. Later, he listened to the great preacher, Charles H. Spurgeon. Moody thought, the world has yet to see, with and for and through and in, a man. Barley meant any man. Barley didn't say that he had to be educated or brilliant or anything else, just a man. Well, by the Holy Spirit in him, Moody would be one of those men. And then suddenly, in that high gallery, he saw something he never realized before. It was not Spurgeon, Mr. Spurgeon, after all, who was doing that work, it was God. And if God could use Mr. Spurgeon, why would he not use the rest of us? And why should we not all just lay ourselves at the master's feet and say to him, send me, use me? Dwight L. Moody was an ordinary person who sought to be fully and wholly consecrated to Christ. One ordinary Christian in the hand of Almighty God can do anything God commands. Through his, this one common life, God began to do the extraordinary. Moody became one of the greatest evangelists of modern times. He preached in revival services across Britain and America where hundreds of thousands came to Christ. Moody is looking at Spurgeon. I told you in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, we have to look to God. Dwight L. Moody is reportedly poorly educated, 
unordained, and he is a shoe salesman. Nothing to do with the Bible if you're a shoe salesman. You're just going from place to place. This is the, the late 1800s when he started preaching. The late 1800s, he's just going from house to house, place to place, trying to sell shoes. But he felt the unction of the Holy Spirit. He felt the unction of God calling him to preach. So he looks to somebody who's already preaching. He looks to Charles Spurgeon. Both these guys we studied in seminary. So he looks to Charles Spurgeon, but one day he got to a point where he realized Spurgeon is not doing all these miraculous things at all. It is God working through Spurgeon. It is God speaking through Spurgeon. So God takes the son of a bricklayer, a shoe salesman, and turns him into the greatest, one of the greatest evangelists of all time, even before Billy Graham came on the scene. God wants to use you, regardless of your background, regardless of your career, regardless of what you have done, regardless of where you've been, God wants to use you. If God could use Spurgeon, this is the conclusion that the right movie came to. If God can use Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, if God can use him, why can't he use all of us? The truth of the matter is, he uses all of us when we unveil ourselves and yield ourselves to the Almighty God. What is it that God is trying to get out of you? How can God use you? You must come to the same conclusion that the white L. Moody came to. God sent me. God used me. Are you willing to be sent? Are you willing to be used? On our domestic mission trip, God changed the lives of young and old people because God used all of us. I could see the whole team gelling together. I could see the eyes being open to new stuff. Before we left here, they didn't know who B.B. King was, no, knew very little about the Civil Rights Movement, and they served senior citizens. God is able to use little bitty children to do miraculous work. Went over to a senior citizen complex, and as we were playing at that complex, the people were like little children. Senior citizens were like little children, watching little children being used by God. They sit in the middle of the cul-de-sac in chairs to watch little children demonstrate how God can use them. So don't sit and do nothing. Tell God, God, I can be used by you. You have said God is incapable of doing, I'm at the top of page 28, God is incapable of doing anything significant through someone like you. And this is where I put my asterisk. The truth is, God is able to do anything he pleases with one ordinary person who fully concentrates himself to God. Who fully consecrated, who is fully consecrated, who is fully consecrated to God. Would you be willing to make yourself holy, available to God? Final paragraph talks about on page 28 talks about the fact that God has standards that are different from our standards. Don't be surprised at God's standards of excellence. God has standards of excellence. Don't be surprised if God's standards of excellence are different than the world's standards. The world says, get all you can. 
put the lid on the can, and set on the lid. God says, give and it, it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Man says, always be first so you can get there first. Always be first so you can receive as much as you want to. God says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Man says, whatever you do, do whatever you can do to build up your body. And that we ought to do. God says, your body is the temple of God. It ought to be dedicated to him. So what's our motive? Why we do what we do? Jesus talks about the fact that John the Baptist is the greatest of all times. We know that Jesus is above everybody who ever walked the earth. And Jesus himself tells us that John the Baptist is the greatest among any other man born to a woman. Isn't that all right? So what he's saying is that when you, when you compare John the Baptist to other men, there is none like John the Baptist. And we must conclude that there is none like Jesus. Don't measure your life. And I ask you this paragraph. Don't measure your life by the world's standards. Many denominations, many churches, many individuals have measured their lives by the world's standards. And by the world's standards, people are impressive, with to, they are impressive to people. He goes on to talk about how churches rate themselves and how people rate churches. I put an asterisk here because it spoke to me. God doesn't measure success based on whether or not you are a mega church. God's success is rated based on what you're doing with your church. Amen. Amen. Your church is not an impressive church to God unless you are calling men, women, boys, and girls to souls in Jesus Christ. As you can see behind me, you got all these robots behind me and children have just rearranged the whole room this week and next week and the following week because we, it's our robotics month where they're doing robots and they're doing all the other things. How many people are we able to influence based on what we're doing at the New Beginning Church? And I asked this question that I've asked before. I asked this question again. If New Beginning Church is no longer in this neighborhood, will we be missed by the world? If we just go away overnight, shut the doors, will this neighborhood miss us? Or will it just keep driving by? As if nothing was ever here. There's a, there's a church in Dallas that was sitting in the heart of a rundown neighborhood. The pastor asked the question, if this church moved out of the neighborhood, would anybody miss us? The people said yes. And because the people said that the community would miss them, now they have a washeteer in the neighborhood that's run by the church. They have a, a, a children ministry in the neighborhood that flocks to the church. They have a, 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 a ministry for recovering dope addicts that's run by the church. They have a, a jail, uh, when you get out of jail and you have to go to a halfway house run by the church. The Washington doesn't have money, it's all by fire, run by the church. They have a, a unwed mother dorm there where women who get pregnant can come to this dorm that's run by the church and they can feel loved and needed. And it came because the pastor asked one question. If we leave this neighborhood, can we leave the neighborhood and nobody misses us? And then they have a pantry about 30,000 square feet big that they feed people every day. A clothing 
part of their pantry that they give clothes to the homeless. They are making a big impact in the neighborhood based on one question. If we were to use the neighborhood, leave this neighborhood, will anybody miss us? There's a word called kanania. That's a good test question. Kanania, 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 kanania is when we, we get in touch with God. Kanania, we, 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 we commune, we have an intimate relationship. Sister David Davis read that passage that says we ought to have an intimate relationship with God. It's called Kanania. There's another word, and it's, it's called incarnation leadership. Incarnational leadership. I N C A R N A T I O N. I N C A R N A T I O N. Incarnation. I didn't say carnation milk. I said incarnation. Incarnation means that Jesus has moved into the neighborhood. It means that incarnate Christ, Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, the visible image of the invisible God has shown up in the neighborhood. And he has moved into the neighborhood. And since he has moved into the neighborhood, the neighborhood is made different. The church ought to be the incarnation of Christ, as Christ is the incarnation of God himself. The church ought to be the visible image of Christ, because Christ is the visible image of God. Christ, the one who died for us. Christ, the one who was buried. Christ, the one who rose from the dead. And that same Christ can make us whole spiritually. If we're going to be holy, if we're going to be the incarnate Christ, the incarnate living body of believers in this community, we have to first be born again. Amen. We have to be born again by believing that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And the invitation is next step for us to come to Christ right now. Believing the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on Calvary. He was buried in a bar or two. And early that very day morning, he rose from the dead. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know him. The door of the church is open. So now you're here with me and invite Jesus into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again for your sins. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, believe that Jesus is the Son of God that died for your sins and rose from the dead. We believe that you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. We believe that you have a reserved place in heaven. Well, we thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God, for he is God all by him, himself. We serve the amazing God. We want to lift Sister Cora Woods before God in prayer. We want to lift Sister Woods, Sister Cora Woods before God in prayer. Uh, the family has asked, and I am asking that you do not make any phone calls as she does need her rest. Her, her surgery was, was successful, so we want to thank God for that praise report that her, service was very, her surgery was very successful. We thank God for that. But please, ma'am, please, sir, even you who are friends, don't make any phone calls right now. There are rest, you're 100%, so we can run her some more. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank the Lord. We certainly want to lift up the Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship Church in Dallas, Texas. We want to lift that church in prayer. We want to lift up Pastor Dr. Tony Evans.
or lift them in prayer as we um, as they go through swift transitions. We lift that church and the man of God in prayer. Amen. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or uh, prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. We're going to pray for Sister Nicole Davis. We're lifting, lifting her in, in prayer. We're lifting Thank Sister Davis. Thank you for the prayers for Sally Skill, all the individuals. What's the name? Sally Skill, the part where I live. Thank you for the prayers for them. Amen. Well, we're praying for Sally. Sally Scales. It's all better now, but yes. Yes, we're praying continually for that apartment complex that God does a miraculous work there. Amen? It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. Amen. Hallelujah. If you need a humble oak, raise your hand and you will be served. If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting God Jesus at yahoo.com is our zero account. If you want to mail in your gifts, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 that is P.O. Box 503 Missouri City that is Missouri City, Texas 77459 Love business, thank you for visiting with us. Thanks for being a part of our service. We appreciate you tuning in to us. What I want everybody to do is share this video. Also share our Sunday worship service and also like our New Beginning Church page. We want to thank God for the opportunity to publish the gospel throughout the world. Amen. Thank God for the opportunity. Very good story we found as we went to South Haven, Mississippi, and Horn Lake, Mississippi. Uh, in 2004, I, was, I led a mission trip to um, Jeremawaba. Jeremawaba is in Brazil, Jeremawaba, Brazil. And I was in it, we went to, the, the children went to play instruments at this Brazilian church. And my sister and I introduced me to this pastor and I was telling him, we've done missions in Brasilia, Brazil, and Jeremawaba, Brazil. And he said, hey. And I said, we worked along with a missionary there. And he said, do you know what the missionary name was? And I said, Jefferson. He said, well, was it Keith Jefferson? This is 20 years ago. He said, I said, yeah, it was Keith Jefferson. He said, well, his daughter is about to walk through the door. And she was about 14 years old. And now 20 years later, I get to hug her and, and, and talk about her dad and her mom and how they led us in missions because this whole family moved from the United States over to Brazil and they, they became uh, bilingual and they were raised in the Brazilian couple, uh, culture and, and they began to speak Portuguese and English and she was videotaping that night. So that was a, that was a great reunion, right? But it gets better. So the pastor standing there, he said, hey, let me introduce you to my wife, Lucy. So Lucy comes out and she said, I know you. I said, really? Did you take me to jail or something? <laughs> she said, no, I know your face. I have a picture of you standing under the tree doing stories. Remember I told you we could not talk about Jesus because we had to do stories of nature. And she said, I know you, I have a picture of you from 20 years ago in 2004. And in 2004, we didn't have cell phones with us. She pulled up her cell phone and she showed me a picture of her and me under the tree and she was my interpreter 20 years ago. And she's married to the Brazilian pastor right there in, in Horn Lake, Mississippi. That was amazing to me. So when I go back, uh, I've been invited to come and share the word of God with them. And she and he get to be my interpreters one more time. Isn't God good? That's, that's pretty good to me. That's amazing. 20 years later, she was this little bitty girl. We were standing under the tree. And I don't know how she recognized me because I wore a baseball cap everywhere I went. And she showed me a picture of her and me standing up. And so now when I go back, I'm taking this whole book of pictures that we did ministry 
and Jeremiah Brazil. And she was not only my interpreter, she was Sister Davis' interpreter, she was Brother Keith Je Jefferson's inter interpreter, and many others. So that was simply amazing to me. God is doing extraordinary things through ordinary people. Hallelujah. Come on, we stand and be this. Father God, we thank you now. We thank you for taking the ordinary and doing extraordinary things. Bless our lives, Father God, that we will walk with you, that we will always hold to you, that we will always remember you. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to use us now. Send us now. Bless us now. Lord, keep us focused. Keep us in your will. And bless us to be in your divine ways. So in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Now to him we, that keeps us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Lord, we pray, Father God, for those who are ill. And we pray for Sister Nicole Davis. We pray, Father God, for, for Sister Cora Woods. We thank you for the great report of the apartment complex. We ask you to bless us in our going. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us with travel and grace. Never leave our side and bless us to be about your business. Bless the choir as they come to sing unto you. Give them grace. Give them mercy. Give them wisdom, understanding, and power. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you bless us now. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We are a united church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you. You are dismissed.